Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ashley Ridley from State Promotions Department for Trade and Investment, and welcome to our Round 4 India in Market webinar. It's great to have you tune in today. The whole purpose of these webinars is to ensure local industry receives the latest and most reliable information on the impact of COVID-19 on market conditions. And who better place to deliver these webinars than our own South Australian Government offshore representatives to source this information, or as with today's situation, our friends in Austrade India. So a huge thanks to Austrade for partnering with the South Australian Government in order to, uh, to deliver this session. So a little bit about our presenters who will be chatting to us about what's happening in India. Firstly, we will hear from Ashish Sharma, who's the team leader for education in Austrade South Asia. Ashish will just demonstrate his seven year Austrade experience and knowledge to discuss topical issues in the education sector. Following Ashish, we have Yasa Sirikwi, Business Development Manager, Austrade India, facilitating a Q&A session about food with Vikash Sinkal, who is the Managing Director of Sunbeam Ventures. Now, you've probably already heard or you already know of Sunbeam Ventures. It's a leading, fast-moving consumer goods arena and represents our very own South Australian company, San Remo. Um, just a couple of housekeeping before we do get started. Um, this session is being recorded. It will be uploaded to the Department for Trade and Investments website. We welcome questions. Just submit them through the Q&A field on the right-hand side of your screen, but ensure they're directed to all panellists so that we can see them. If we run out of time and we haven't got to your question, I'll contact you personally and connect you to the most appropriate departmental representative. And lastly, at the end of the session, please take the time to complete a short 10-second poll. Um, so let's get started. We head over to Ashish. Welcome. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and all to you and also to your team members for inviting us today to this session so that we can provide an uh, update on India and also, you know, in the wider South Asia region in two different sectors. So I'll kick off with education sector and then I'm having my colleague Yasser who will kind of going to take care of FMCG and FNB products as well. Um, very quickly, I have about five odd minutes, um, so I'm going to cover uh, the things which are happening in international education, what it means for Australia at this point of time, and you know what's our view from here in India, both for Australia and you know, what's really happening in South Asia and what we are trying to do. So we understand that the key considerations for international education recovery for Australia is kind of dependent on many different things. The very first thing is the pipeline effects. We understand that about 35% of students are currently onshore. And we also understand that for you know, the next recruitment, we do not really have uh, many students who are currently taking English language training or tests because of lockdowns across many different countries. So that's going to have an impact on international education. We also understand that uh, you know, as we were trying to uh, discuss earlier in March or April that maybe the recovery will be V-shaped. But now as per the BCG analysis, uh, which they have done after speaking to the universities and vocational education providers in Australia, we understand that recovery may not be V-shaped. You know, it will be a bit distort, we think. And there may be about 18 to 24 months of, you know, recovery time which we need. So what it means, it means that we need, need to really ramp up our marketing efforts in the market. Um, you know, both in South Asia and in other markets as well. Um, and we definitely need to, uh, you know, have more certainty as we need, as we are kind of going forward. But what we can do is what we can control. Uh, it's all about maintaining Australia's credibility in the market. We understand that there are major interdependencies uh, when it comes to recovery of international education in terms of visa, air travel, what sort of quarantine facilities are going to be there in Australia and also part-time jobs because, you know, at this point of time, students uh, from many different countries and primarily from South Asia are looking at how economies are tracking and whether there will be part-time jobs because you understand that many of the students, once they land in Australia, they would like to do some, uh, you know, part-time jobs along with their studies as well. We understand the pain of the universities and institutes. Uh, we do know that they are high fixed costs uh, for our Australian education providers. Uh, and there is huge dependence on international education. So I would like to assure you that Australian Trade and Investment Commission, along with many other government agencies and state agencies uh, 
from South Australia. We are trying our best to contain the risk at this point of time. The last but not the least, we understand that vocational education and training will be critical to develop the skills for post-COVID economy. But the challenge at this point of time is to you know, restart the courses back in Australia. The support for international students, I'm not going to kind of talk more broadly about that. You all are currently based in Australia. You very well know uh, the Commonwealth assistance which has been given to international students. Uh, there has been ban on evictions from housing. Uh, students in year two or beyond can access their superannuation and there is health access to the healthcare system as well. Um, so, you know, at this point of time, what I would like to reiterate is, you, which you might have heard from many other people, the more, uh, you know, appreciation we will have towards international students at this point of time, the better it is going to be for Australia, because we do understand that Australia's economy is, uh, you know, a large part of economy is dependent on the international students and not just these students coming to the universities and institutes, but the spillover effect which uh, it has on uh, the consumption and housing and other sectors as well. We do understand that online learning is currently, uh, you know, um, the buzzword which everyone is talking about. And many of the universities, they are trying to provide online uh, medium to the international students who currently are in Australia. And, you know, some of them who couldn't really travel to Australia because of lockdown. Um, but we have observed in the market that the students in semester one who are enrolling now, uh, there has been a bit of reluctance to go online because this, you know, what we were hearing from the university representatives here is that the students are saying that if we have to study first semester or maybe the first or second semester online, then why we should pay that much fee. I reckon that uh, there is a bit of work which we all need to do uh, as stakeholders in this sector and the agencies here in South Asia are trying their best. Uh, we are providing our utmost support to Department of Education, Skills and Employment here to, uh, you know, uh, pr put the um, insights from the market on the table, which DESI can use then to engage with the governments in all the South Asian countries. And I can assure you that a lot of work is kind of currently happening behind the scenes. Talking about the student numbers, um, at this point of time, we are having about um, 185,000 plus international students from Australia, from South Asia who are currently enrolled in uh, uh, Australia, out of which definitely a large proportion of students come from India, about 105,000 plus. And after that, Nepal is the second uh, biggest source country from South Asia, which kind of provides 56,000 plus students. But the percentage change from the last year was definitely terrific. We had, uh, you know, good growth in all the markets, um, uh, which was beyond 13, 14 odd percent. From India, we had 21 percent growth, but from Bangladesh, we had 8 percent growth. But when we kind of, uh, you know, uh, when the pandemic uh, kind of occurred at that point of time, we do understand that there are some serious impacts on the market, and we currently are trying to understand the impact on the market uh, and also, you know, how much it will impact on the student numbers going to Australia at this point of time. But the numbers which I have, um, you know, quoting Desi's number here, um, we understand that in the first semester, about 2,470 students have uh, deferred their studies uh, from India and about 683 students have deferred their studies from uh, Nepal as well. Now, looking at the markets, uh, you know, there has been numerous uh, surveys which are going on. I was looking at some of the QS top universities survey, um, which first came up in March and then again came up in May. Um, and the numbers or, you know, are not really that great in terms of um, what the students are thinking. Uh, a large proportion of students are thinking to defer their semester uh, or if possible, look at, um, you know, options of studies at home or, you know, if they were looking at country X at about six months ago, now they are looking at, you know, country Y. But I can assure you that Australia is managing its reputation the way Australia has handled COVID crisis. That's really exemplary. And, you know, the students and the parents and other stakeholders, they are kind of taking a note of that as well. And this is something, these positive stories about student engagement, how Australia is managing COVID crisis, and you know how we are kind of recovering in terms of COVID in Australia. These are really powerful messages 
uh, which we all are sending out and I would request all of you to keep on doing that because it improves our credibility in the market and how good or bad a country has managed the COVID crisis, it definitely is going to have an impact on the future student enrollments. Um, one of the surveys which an education consultancy has done here in uh, South Asia, I would like to quote that, the three biggest challenges which they have observed were uh, uncertainty around intake or visa was the topmost concern. The second was around how a particular university has managed uh, COVID crisis and what particular uh, uh, you know, safety measures they have put in place. That was the second biggest, biggest question from the students and the agents. And the third one was delay in results. As you all understand that due to lockdown conditions, um, both uh, here in India and in other countries uh, in the region, the results have been delayed at some of the places. The exams have been delayed as well. And we do understand that it's going to have a cascading impact on the sector and on the international student rec recruitment to Australia. Now, you know, we were looking at some of the base assumptions for medium term impact. Uh, you know, when it comes to recruitment trends, we understand that board exam delays are going to impact the sector for some time. And we are now wondering uh, and also working on if we can leverage the partnership between Australian institutions and universities with South Asian institutions uh, to develop some articulation arrangements. When it comes to um, you know, delivery of education services, as I already have said, that the students are uncertain. They are kind of looking at many different um, options and the way a country is now going to treat their international students and you know, they are going to manage their COVID crisis within the country, that's going to have huge impact on the perception of that particular destination uh, for the international students. When it, when it comes to uh, you know, social, social engagement, I reckon that we still need to bridge the perceptions gap here in South Asia. Um, one of the questions which I received from Ashley yesterday was how Australia is tracking in terms of uh, competitor activity here in the market. So you know, the credibility of Australia is much, much stronger. Um, and uh, at this point of time, the students are looking at uh, you know, what Australia is doing with the international students. Sorry that the same kind of you know, theme is kind of coming again and again, but you know, it's all about international students and the perception of Australia in the market. Uh, digitalization is going to be the catalyst in the market. Um, you know, the universities are rolling online programs, and now we are also looking at how we can leverage uh, the online initiatives being started by South uh, governments in the South Asian countries to put some um, open courses here in here in the market so that the students have a bit of taste of what it's like to study in Australia. At this point of time, Austrade is specifically running virtual masterclass series in which we have roped in about nine universities from Australia and we have uh, delivered 21 masterclasses to 6,000 plus students or educators in the market. This helps us to build the credibility of Australia as an education destination and also, um, um, you know, promote the capability of Australia as well. Finally, um, the government of India, as we all know from the last few years, is working on their own initiative, which is called Study in India. Um, so India attracts only 0.8% of internationally mobile students. And the government of India is very keen to kind of double that number in the next five odd years and also are doing a series of uh, reforms in the market to have some of their universities in top 200 in the next 10 to 15 odd years. So, you know, Indian government is also very active to either have these international, internationally mobile students from India to stay back in India or to attract students from other markets in India as well. So slowly we will see India also kind of, uh, you know, becoming one of our competitors, although it is also a source of market for us. Um, now, looking at the market recovery strategy, we have defined these strategies into three different parts. The first one was what we can do in short term. We thought that it will be better for all of us to communicate student welfare support to the education stakeholders, highlight Australia's online education capability, and also uh, support the Australian universities and um, institutions to deal with the risk of lockdowns and help them to market their courses or reach out to 
wider educational stakeholders in the market. That's what we are doing. In the medium term, you would, uh, you know, for those who were here for Australia and your business exchange, they would remember that we were working on market action plan uh, where Austrade and the Australian government agencies are working with the state and territory education agencies to create market action plan for India. And we are trying to see that how we can align all of our efforts to have a focused strategy in the market. A lot of work is happening behind the scenes, so that's something which is in medium term uh, focus for us. We also uh, are working on digital engagement toolbox. A report has been produced by Austrade about six months ago and at this point of time the team is working on some of the infographics which we will be sending your way through social media so that we can kind of uncover the insights of digital landscape here in India which you can utilize to refine your strategies and you know you can use digit digital mediums in a more effective way to market your courses in India. We are also trying to have coordinated promotions with state and institutions but uh, Reflecting on another, another question which came from Ashley yesterday, um, at this point of time, uh, you know, large recruitment events are not possible because of the lockdown uh, measures being taken by the governments here. But the universities are currently taking uh, virtual showcases, and I understand that the uptake, although, is not comparable to what it would be uh, to, to a, a market showcase. Uh, but I think that the numbers are tracking really well. In terms of long-term um, strategies for us, uh, we want to kind of, you know, utilize Australia's reputation to manage COVID to further strengthen Australia's brand in the market and improve the credibility as well. Also, on top of that, we are trying to, uh, you know, promote Australia as an education destination by providing information on the capability of Australia in many different sectors. And finally, uh, you know, we are trying to push in market courses, trying to look at opportunities which, uh, you know, which can help us to put our courses online. So that's, that's kind of more or less from our side. Um, very quickly, touching on the campaigns, at this point of time, Austrid, uh, South Asia is running six different campaigns to maintain uh, or rebuild Australia's perception in the market to maintain the credibility and also to position Australia as an education destination. The very first one, what we, have, what we did was in May, uh, was WhatsApp outreach where we publicized Australia's support for international students to education uh, stakeholders across South Asia through WhatsApp. Uh, our teams here, we are directly connected to about 3,000 3, plus decision makers in the education sector and we have uh, sent some information to them through WhatsApp and it has been uh, you know, it has received a lot of positive feedback from the education stakeholders as well. Then we are trying to do virtual masterclass series, as I've already told you. We have uh, delivered 21 masterclasses in phase one, and now we are managing for phase two. The third one is the school's video competition, uh, which we are going to start from this month. And, you know, this will be to promote South Asia to promote Australian education capabilities and credentials to South Asian school students. And last year we have, um, we, last year we have reached about 6 million uh, impressions on, South, uh, on social media. And you know, this year we are trying to promote this competition again. Then uh, there is an In Aus Together social media campaign, which we are running from this week. And uh, you know, the Australian celebrities are, kind of thanking the Indian students currently uh, on social media who are adding value to Australian communities. Very quickly, the last two campaigns, we are also putting a number of LinkedIn articles uh, for you to uncover, for you to understand uh, what's really happening in the market, the changes in the environment, and what it means for you. So please watch out our LinkedIn space there as well. And finally, Digital Toolbox campaign to help you understand digital landscape as a whole. So that's it from my side. Um, I know that I've taken about 12 odd minutes, and I'll now hand over to Yasser for further. Uh, Fascinating insights, Ash. In fact, platinum stuff from the team. Uh, thank you, Ash, uh, for 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 giving this insight. Good afternoon, South Australia. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of interviewing one of the leading food importers in the country. For introduction, uh, Vikas is the managing director of Sunbeam Ventures, headquartered out of South India. 
Um, Sunbeam Ventures has their origin from 1974 and started as a commodity trading business, which has now evolved into import and distribution company uh, with distribution network across uh, India. The company represents several international brands, um, including uh, San Remo from Australia and also Rafferty Garden, Rafferty's Garden from Victoria. Well, Vikash uh, is a postgraduate from India's prestigious Indian Institute of Management and uh, and is a prolific writer. I have read uh, some of his articles and most importantly, he's a good friend of Australia. A very warm welcome, Vikash. Thank you, Yasser, and good afternoon to everyone in Australia from here. Uh, well, Vikash, uh, I'll throw some rapid fire questions <laughs> to your side. Sure. Uh, perhaps uh, my first question, which is, I think, the, the need of the, uh, how do you assess the impact of lockdown on food imports in India? And what are you hearing uh, uh, on when the retail segment will revive to the earlier levels? Uh, so I'll uh, take this question in two part, Yasser. Yeah, uh, first, I'll speak about the lockdown in general. What we have seen is that uh, the lockdown in general across the world has resulted in a uh, slowdown in the economy as well as various sectors. Some of the sectors like hotels and uh, restaurants have um, actually come to a standstill, whereas uh, the retail is still functioning at the moment. So, um, and uh, specifically uh, for the food, the second part is that Thankfully, food is one of the essential commodities uh, which is required. So it has not been hit as luxury goods. So food is doing well. And uh, in fact, uh, if we see the sales happening, for some of the products, the sales have actually uh, become 3x from what they were earlier. Uh, essential commodities, pasta, different kinds of, uh, you know, kits, uh, ready to prepare at home, uh, immunity booster products, all these sales have shot up uh, very, very uh, drastically. But uh, on the other hand, uh, what we have seen is the luxury goods, things like high-end chocolates, things like probably uh, indulgent uh, biscuits, and uh, you know the uh, impulse goods. The impulse goods sales have uh, drastically dropped. So uh, it has been a mixed bag for the food industry. Um, but yes, I would say overall our sales have dropped a bit, but it has been uh, not so bad as the other sectors. Uh, coming to retail, uh, what we see is that uh, retail is still functioning. But uh, earlier, we used to sell our products in maybe uh, 400 shops in a particular city to get, uh, let's say, X volume, now we get uh, 0.7x, but only from 10 to 20 shops. So what we have seen is the concentration of retail happening. Some of the shops which are open have uh, said uh, the sales have increased almost 7x. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vikash. Um, another question is what uh, what are the uh, what are the I mean, uh, what are significant imported products? Which which are the categories you see will, and which of them, as you mentioned earlier, uh, uh, high end chocolates, etc., would have a low priority? So, can you elaborate on the more traction uh, categories? Yeah. So, what we are seeing is that uh, consumers are spending uh, a lot of time at home, either working from home or uh, preferring to stay at home rather than office, uh, as compared to earlier. Also, they are not uh, so very open to going out to restaurants and having food, but uh, they would definitely like to have the foods which are which they have normally at restaurant at home also. So things like you know if you have a ready to prepare kit, um, for example, we import uh, ready to prepare kits uh, from Thailand for maybe the Thai green curry and the Thai red curry, which they can prepare in a few simple steps. So we are seeing that. Um, this has a uh, very significant uh, growth in sales. Uh, similarly, we have uh, other products. Uh, what to go and uh, probably buy in uh, different ingredients and uh, try and figure out how to prepare it. They would like to have an easy way out, wherein you know they just know you know mix these and uh, the food products are ready. I mean the dish is ready. So. We are seeing significant uh, traction in that. 
you're seeing uh, significant uh, growth in pasta but i think uh, that's all over the world uh, if you have ready to eat pasta yes that is seeing a uh, significant growth second category what we are seeing a significant growth is in immunity booster products you know people are buying more of well being products uh, products which they believe can be uh, helpful for them to boost their immunity as well as uh, you know their health so we are seeing uh, quite high traction in this also uh, snacking the large bag snacking rather than the impulse snacking is seeing uh, quite a lot of uh thank you vikash uh, uh fascinating insights uh, can you throw some light on e-commerce in india uh, that's the talk of the town in india as well as australia and we are heavily yeah. pushing uh, e-commerce as a next growth channel for australian brands in india can you some uh, can you share some actual insider news on e-commerce and where it's going sure uh there's no doubt about it that the industry which has benefited the most by the lockdown has been e-commerce in fact uh, some of the uh bigger e-commerce uh, executives say that e-commerce has been pushed 6 to 8 years ahead in the future because of the lockdown uh we are seeing uh, so much sales happening in e-commerce that uh, some of the companies are struggling to meet the orders you know i think last month uh, flipkart was shut down for 10 days because they had so much orders that they cannot uh, they could not process it. um for at the moment i would say that definitely e-commerce is the way ahead uh, in for the future uh, more so you know all the companies are reevaluating their strategies for offline trade and uh, developing a strong team for online we have seen over the last uh, two months uh, plenty of last mile uh, delivery companies uh, mushrooming all over the country and um, significant growth in e-commerce activities also today if you really see uh, to reach out to the specific consumer uh, for imported products uh, wherein you know the imported products are uh, sensitive in nature and value added and the kind of consumers who would have it which would uh, more likely to buy in the e-commerce or from uh, online shops so to reach out to them today e-commerce offers the best uh return for every penny spent so yes for all the australian companies out there i would say please do look at e-commerce as a major tool uh in india for both uh letting your brand be known to the consumer and also for sales thank you vikash in fact to supplement that e-commerce is now a unified platform to reach out to consumers across india so that's how we are also pushing in fact we have an australian store on amazon india which is doing quite well and we are finally back mm-hmm. now delivering all the non essential items to uh, to consumers um a, a trick question for you can you uh, can you share some top line on the food regulations and labeling standards has it improved or do you see more scope of improvement well um i think uh, food regulation standards in india you know for uh issue maybe 4 years ago when uh, they had come out with new rules which were a bit uh, strict on all of us uh but over the last 4 to 5 years uh, there has been a lot of dilution in these rules a lot of exceptions been made so uh i mean food uh, laws are now uh more easily adaptable by the companies exporting from ab- abroad um there are some mandatory requirements which uh, we have to meet uh, for uh, importing all the products in india for example the manufacturer's name address should be there on the product the batch number should be there uh, the best before dates so most of these are things which uh, normally you would find all over the world but then uh, there are some specific requirements which uh, should be there also on the product like the green dot which signifies a uh, vegetarian product or the red dot which signifies uh, non vegetarian uh, ingredients being used in the product and uh, also the importer's name address and uh, various other details uh, like uh, like the declarations in case of uh, synthetic colors used so all these uh, also need to be met but uh, these could be applied by us so uh, there have been uh, you know quite a lot of relaxations in the rule which makes it easier to import in india 
but um, also uh, you know there are a lot of great batches in the uh, ingredients so you know i would definitely advise company to ensure that they comply with all the rules before it's actually imported well how should a new south australian exporter with no um, no no importer or no distributor present in the market should approach the market what is the first golden rule you think uh, uh, any any australian south australian exporter should uh, should think of well uh, i think uh, the first rule is yasir at austrade i think that's the best way to get into india <laughs> but uh, you know on a serious note uh, i think uh, uh there are two uh, approaches which normally exporters take for india one wherein you know they look uh india as a source of additional revenue wherein uh, you know they are selling all over the world or uh, in australia and whatever sales come from india uh is additional and the other approaches where they take india very seriously as a market wherein they want to develop they want their brand to be present and uh, have a significant uh, sales in india maybe let's say 3 years down the line um in the first case yes um, you know australia has been doing a fantastic job in india as uh, yasir mentioned you know that uh, they are the first ones to have an amazon e store and um, apart from that they have been uh, in very uh, i mean they are always uh, heard let me put it like that australia uh, among the importer community australia is always there in top of the mind recall among the the few uh, trade departments from countries so australia has done a very good job and you can contact australia to find out good importers in india and uh, you know do business with them but yes if you are looking at the second option and i would uh, very strongly advise companies to look at this second option because there's huge uh, potential so i would uh, definitely say you know it would be good to be in touch with our state and also to come down yourself have a look at the uh, indian market research the indian market know exactly what moves what doesn't move what are the consumer habits how you would like to position your product in the minds of the consumer and then launch your product and do uh, back it up with uh, significant uh, marketing and promotion support uh there is a very good potential that down the line you know you will get very good volumes i mean there could be uh, an uh, eclipse of the volumes which you currently do in australia as well i mean you could do more volumes in india than in australia but uh, let me also put a caveat to that because you know a lot of people are um, attracted by the indian middle class and they you know say that india has got uh, 1.4 billion population and such a big middle class and you know we have a huge market out here yes india has a significant uh, middle class and the uh, middle class which has got a growing purchasing power and uh, yes there is uh, significant sales which you can get but then uh, we also need to understand that uh, you know apart from the ability to buy there should also be the willingness to buy india also has a huge production base of food and uh, vegetables in india they um, most of the people are uh, familiar with the indian taste and uh, tastes which are from abroad are alien to them so you know to get them uh, to buy the products this is also the challenge so we need to change habits we need to change uh, the tastes of the people and that's when uh, that's where the challenge comes and that's where the companies need to work on to improve their sales yes in fact for us also we we don't target india as a 1.3 billion population for australia i think it's only 6200 million people who who drink a wine who go to uh, australia for tourism and send their children for overseas for education uh, my second last question since you are running out of time i have plenty of them though uh, can you throw some light on how sandremo is doing in india and uh, what are the what are the different things you are doing with sandremo in the market yeah but um so sandremo has two brands one is sandremo and one is biondi so um with sandremo we position the brand as premium coming in from australia um so we say made with 100% uh, australian wheat and uh, we try and position them into the premium stores the a class uh, stores 
with the second brand beyond the which is more of a, a mass market product we place it in the country and uh, in uh, let's say b plus shops b shops and we uh, position and we target uh, value for money consumers so with sandra mo we do a plenty of, uh, we do plenty of promotions and uh, point of sale displays um highlight the fact that it's been uh, it's more than uh, 50 years in australia that they have been selling they are the market leaders in australia and uh, the products are 100% made in australia with 100% australia so we try and highlight those facts and uh, sandramo is pretty well known now and we uh, very good in the a class of Thank you, Vikash. In fact, I have seen Sandra Mo in smaller mom and pop stores as well, which is a big uh, okay. shout out to you guys. Uh, last question, um, uh, sort of a personal mm -hmm. one. How what what has changed uh, uh, with COVID? Uh, a personal perspective for you? Um, I think uh, you know, with COVID, uh, what we have now is a new normal, not the. Uh, you know things are trying to get back to normal but it's a new normal i mean there's been a fundamental shift uh in the way we lead our lives uh some uh, such a big shift which probably i have not experienced during my life i do not think you know it would be uh, so easy to go out to restaurants again or movie theaters again i mean travel is going to be a challenge for me i I've always used to be traveling for 20 days in a month so i'm um, the first question everybody asks me is you know how come you're stuck at home and how are you you know coping with that so uh, yes it's going to be a very challenging uh, one i think uh, our whole lifestyles are changing uh, you know the way we uh, lead our lives are changing uh, we need to take care of our health more because uh, uh, you know we tend to not be so much active as before so we need to exercise more and other we need to take care of the foods we eat so that is uh, definitely a more awareness on uh, high sugar food so we need to take care of that and uh, you know i think uh, you know the fact that you know we have to end up seeing each other on the uh, computer rather than in person is also a challenge thank you akash fascinating insights and great to hear about the opportunities for south australian exporters in the market we will continue to uh, push them through to you uh, and if there's any sure. if participant who is keen to speak to vikash please get in touch with ashley or myself or vikash directly he's quite active on linkedin uh, you can just write to us and be happy to introduce to you vikash um, over to you ashley for question answer sessions Thank you so much. We've had Ashish, uh, Vikash, and Yasa. Uh, that fabulous uh, presentations and a Q and A session has been great. I'm sure our attendees would have found this information very helpful and interesting. Um, Ashish, we do miss our international students, and we do look forward to welcoming them back to South Australia soon. So let's hope we see some uh, friendly faces in our state. Um, Ashish, we have, so to our viewers, perhaps I'll just remind you that there is a Q&A function to the right hand side of your screen. Submit any questions. It doesn't have to be about education and food. Um, Yasa can, from Austrade's perspective, can, can answer any questions on any sectors. So it doesn't have to be specifically related to education or food. Um, but uh shaki singh has um has mentioned uh made a comment so to speak so i might throw this over to ashish um uh, shaka is an education consultant for the indian subcontinent in tafe sa here in adelaide um and they, they want to uh to follow all events and uh that, that's provided by austrade so are there any um other than your website because they follow that particularly well but are there any other um forums or newsletters uh, etc that get thrown out to education um or people in, uh, interested in education and also are there any upcoming major events that they could be part of maybe virtually even show sure, ashley thanks for the question um you know at this point of time although we are pushing a lot of market update through our website um, but there is a specific newsletter called market information package which goes out every wednesday to all the australian universities and institutes as you have mentioned that shika works for tafe sa so tafe sa already has subscribed 
to the newsletter. Uh, if she can talk to her international department, she can take those credentials and very well, uh, you know, um, can access that uh, newsletter through our website again. Uh, on the website, on that particular newsletter, we kind of push all the opportunities all of our global offices and the main events. Um, and you know, from the same newsletter, she can also register for these events. That's great to hear, Ashish. Um, and maybe we can do something together in the near future, um, run a virtual event, so to speak. So that's something that we could certainly um, look into. Um, Vikash, I've got a question for you. How is the supply? How is the supply chain doing now? Are ports operating normally? Yes, operating normally, but uh, there has been delay in uh, clearing the goods. Uh, because obviously, you know, uh, everyone is not coming to the office and uh, things are taking a longer time. Uh, people are not uh, there to unload the goods. And uh, and also there has been quite a big backlog because uh, over the last one month, uh, there was a shutdown. So things were not clearing uh, immediately at that point. But um, the delay is slowly getting cleared and soon I think things would be back to normal at the point. That's great. Um, so a couple in regards to the food um, perspective. First of all, do you make assessments based on products? Are there, I see you represent such high quality brands. Um, for our South Australian companies, uh, I'm sure there's a bit of an assessment process perhaps for you to, to represent them. What's involved? Well, uh, typically, uh, when I look at a product, uh, I would uh, look at uh, the, the potential for the Indian market, the willingness of the Indian consumer to buy the product. Uh, second, I would also look at the willingness of the Australian company to be involved in the Indian market, how much uh, they are willing to, you know, how much they are open to uh, working in India, understanding the market, adapting themselves for the uh, Indian market. So those are two of the most important uh, things which I would look at. Also, what would also uh, be important is the future for the uh, brand or the uh, product. I mean, it should not be something which could be easily replicated uh, maybe down the line in India and then you know, be uh, on the pricing front. So I would uh, look at more value added products, products which are difficult to uh, be made in India as well as uh, difficult to have competition. Okay, that's good to know. Um, Siddharth Mitra has, uh, has raised a question for you, Vikash. Currently, there are a few foreign players in the ready to eat segment or not in India. Um, do you suggest to use the online channel to sell ready to eat products or rather offline or both? I would say both. Um, depending on which product it is. Um, I would definitely say uh, go for both. Uh, with uh, the online channels, it's easier for you to uh, reach out to the consumer, have recipes, explain it to them about the nature of the product. So that becomes easier. But uh, it's very important to have an offline presence as well. Uh, gourmet shops like uh, Nature's Basket, Food Hall, these are all very good uh, places wherein your products would sell in very good quantities. So I would say that, you know, you should have a omni business. Yeah, well, that's really good to hear. Um, and another one, Vik uh, Vikash, um, what's next for you from Australia? Are there any particular products? I think you've already touched on this, but um, you might like to expand. <laughs> So uh, I'm always open to looking at uh, new products and I constantly keep looking at uh, innovative products from across the world. Yes, when I come across a product uh, which would uh, fit in all the, uh, you know, the requirements which I mentioned, I would definitely look at uh, one of them. I see there's been a lot of innovation uh, happening in Australia. In fact, uh, there was an uh, inbound uh, Australian uh, delegation which had come some time back and I saw some of the products which they had presented were quite uh, unique. So yes, I mean, never say no. I always uh, look at uh, new products and if I see something good, which is innovative and which meets my criteria, I would definitely. 
at the moment, you know, if you ask me something specific with that I have in mind. Okay, that's great. Um, and Yasa and Ashish, this is probably something that you can expand on. And I know we've already touched on um, Austrade's website with their upcoming events. Um, perhaps you might like to outline those some key activities that Austrade's planning to do in the next few months um, to help SA and Australian exporters. Sure. Um, I'll quickly take the question and then hand it over to Yasser. Um, as I've mentioned, we are working on uh, schools video competition and we are intending to reach out to about 1,000 odd schools here in South Asia. Uh, when I say South Asia, it's India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh primarily, but also schools in Nepal um, uh, and Bhutan as well. So um, in my presentation, I did mention that last year when we have done this um, competition, we had the social media reach of about 6 million uh, students in 20 plus, um, you know, large cities of South Asia. So this year also we are intending to do that. And I have, you know, just yesterday worked on a plan along with the team where we got uh, some budget signed off for this as well. So um, our colleagues, uh, Priyanka Vadyanath, uh, and Neha and Mehenas, they might reach out to the South Australian universities in the near future to end the institutions to request for your participation. If you think that, uh, you know, you would like to position the university and institution and also the courses to the key uh, potential, not really key, but key stakeholders, potential students and the parents, I think this is going to be a really terrific uh, initiative from our side. I'll hand it over to you, sir. Uh, so, uh, at the FNB team here, we have a big team which spreads across South Asia, including Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. We are campaign, with, uh, for example, the first one we did was uh, virtual bias. Uh, we had a fantastic response from Australia as well as India. In fact, we already have uh, exporters to, uh, to, to talk to uh, Indian consumers in pitch their products. Uh, apart we, are, we have, since I mentioned we have a big team, if there's any South Asian exporter who's looking to individually with them and perhaps outline the opportunities uh, for them across uh, the region. That's excellent. I think that's, um, I'm mindful of time. We've just gone over by a couple of minutes. So um, let me take this opportunity to thank you very much for, for tuning in. A huge thanks to our presenters, Ashish, Vikash and Yasser. I'm sure everyone would agree there was some very valuable information provided. So if uh, to our viewers, please take the time to complete the short poll that's now on screen. Um, always happy to receive feedback. Um, there's also a free text box there that you'd like to ask any follow up questions or even you'd might like to connect with one of our presenters happy to to facilitate on your behalf um, and lastly head to our website dti.sa.gov.au um, backslash webinar to remain informed of upcoming webinars this month is um, June our health tech SA month um, with webinars being delivered by some of the brightest minds in biotech clinical trials digital health innovation in health and aging well just to name a few so thank you so much everyone for tuning in our presenters hope to see you here online again soon have a wonderful day